I'm Jeff Liu. I'm the lead instructor for Remote Sensing for Disaster Relief. The class focuses on teaching students how to use geospatial information systems, remote sensing, such as satellite and aerial imagery, and network science for decision making. Uh, the class focuses on the logistical and informational problems that uh, occur after a large scale disaster, such as a hurricane or earthquake. And we brought in sub subject matter experts from various organizations, such as uh, FEMA, the CDC, and uh, DARPA Defense Innovation Unit. The students learn to implement their own GIS and uh, remote sensing analysis pipelines. And in the end, they work on a simulated disaster response, working in teams to do the necessary analysis, planning, and decision making uh, required to successfully protect and evacuate citizens. This is Remote Sensing for Disaster Relief. My name is Jeff Liu. I'm the lead instructor for this course. Uh, so in this course, we covered uh, geospatial information systems, satellite and aerial imagery, deep learning, and network science for disaster management and response. For the final project, the students had to respond to a um, hypothetical hurricane in New England area and perform many emergency management tasks where uh, they have to both plan, respond, and analyze the uh, scenario and make difficult decisions about um, where to uh, allocate their resources and how to get them there. Uh, the students have put together an excellent press conference documenting their entire response. Um, but before that, I would like to uh, thank a few very important people who made this class possible. First off, I'd like to thank uh, my teaching staff, particularly my co-instructor, Renee Garcia Franceschini. Folks, um, Renee, <clears throat> graduate student instructor of this course. Happy to have you all here. Uh, and we have four TAs, Umkar Bellaro. Uh, hi, I'm Umkar. Uh, nice to see you all here. Pratush Das. Hi, my name is Pratush. I hope you guys enjoyed today. Andrew Mascalara. Hello, I'm Andrew Mascalara, and I'm very glad with all the things that you've been able to accomplish in this course today. And Anne-Marie Stupinski. Hi, Anne-Marie here. Thank you all for joining today. I also wanted to shout out a number of guests who help uh, give guest lectures and helped out with making lessons behind the scenes. Uh, in no particular order, Chad Council, Dan Rebunera Braga, Misha Shattuck, Jarleth O'Neill, Katie Piccioni, Rose Gold, and the FEMA Massachusetts Task Force One team, Neil Batra, Ritwick Gupta, and Narav Patel. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the students to uh, start their press conference. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in the remote sensing press conference meant to address the current situation regarding a hurricane in the northeast part of the United States. Specifically, parts of Rhode Island and the, and the Cape Cod of Massachusetts will be hit. To address this hypothetical scenario, our remote sensing class was divided into four teams. The planning team, operations team, logistics team, and public information team. Each team specialized in different parts of this press conference. We'll say the specifics of each team's responsibilities in a bit. My name is AJ Sale, and I was the liaison between the public information team and the logistics team. My name is Nithya Parita, and I was an intermediary between the public information group and the logistics team. I'm Alex Gerber, and I gathered information from the planning team. I'm Christine Ying, and I connected with the operations team. And I'm Charlie Stevenson, and I worked with the operations team throughout this process. We, the public information team, will be presenting for the remote sensing class of BeaverWorks. Now, remote sensing is a general term for the acquisition and processing of information about a phenomenon. In these last four weeks, we learned about geospatial information systems, or GIS, image processing and classification, decision making, and deep learning. With this knowledge, we can implement computer science data into real world applications, just like this mock press conference involving a hurricane named Hurricane Tim, which we have modeled after a FEMA response to natural disasters. Our course focused on disasters and how to analyze and manipulate data to construct an appropriate response to events, such as floods and fires. 
we will be discussing the hypothetical scenario mentioned earlier, as well as what other teams have done. The data harness, harness for this mock disaster response was modeled after real world data. The planning team, operations team, and logistics team will each be doing a 10 minute presentation during the press conference today. After each presentation, we will conduct a mini interview with their representatives before moving on to working with the next team. But before this transpires, we will explain the context and current situation of this hurricane. The NHC or the National Hurricane Center can 100% accurately predict a hurricane's track, timing, or extent of storm surge or flooding. Impact from surges could potentially happen before, during, or after the storm makes landfall. It may impact areas far away from the storm track. It's the largest threat in a hurricane or tropical storm and could cause thousands of businesses and houses to be destroyed and undergo long-term recovery. Hurricanes can have a maximum sustained winds of 74 miles per hour or higher. The most active time for these tropical cyclones in Massachusetts is in late August through September. Direct landfall in Massachusetts by a hurricane or tropical storm is unusual. It's more likely that these types of storms will make landfall in a different location and subsequently impact Massachusetts. Therefore, it is even more important to stay updated about the hurricane and its location at all times. When we look back in time, the majority of the hurricanes that have struck the New England region have recurved northward tracks that parallel the eastern seaboard. They have maintained a slight north-northeast track direction. According to the NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Historical Hurricane Tracker, 39 tropical storm or hurricane events have occurred near Massachusetts between the years of 1842 and 2019. Within that time frame, the state wasn't affected by any Category 4 or 5 hurricanes. However, the state was impacted by 3 Cat 3 hurricanes, 4 Cat 2 hurricanes, and 10 Category 1 hurricanes, as well as 25 tropical storms. In addition to that, within this time period, a total of 31 tropical depressions and extra tropical events impacted the Commonwealth. According to forecasters with the NOAA, a greater than average 2020 Atlantic hurricane season is expected. There is a 60% chance of an above normal season, a 30% chance of a near normal season, and only a 10% chance of a below normal season. With 70% confidence, a likely range of 13 to 19 named storms, of which six to 10 could become hurricanes, including three to six major hurricanes in the categories three to five, with winds of 110 miles per hour or higher. Now, this is an unusual situation that we're finding ourselves in, as the last hurricane to make landfall in New England was Hurricane Bob in 1991, a category two hurricane with maximum sustained winds of 100 miles per hour. Now, Hurricane Bob left extensive th damage throughout New England in its wake, and is also known as one of the costliest hurricanes in New England. $1.5 billion in 1991, which equates to over $2.8 billion today, to be exact. There was moderate rainfall, yet substantial damage. A lot of the information we've gathered today is from the National Beaver Hurricane Center. We expect Hurricane Tim to make landfall late this afternoon along the Massachusetts coast. We anticipate heavy rain, potential flooding, and significant power outages throughout the area of the storm. Hurricane Tim remains a large, dangerous storm. As suggested during this week, think of this as three phases, preparation, response, and recovery. Next, we'll have Charlie, our weatherman, who will give you an update on the storm itself. The hurricane will likely be a category three on the Saphire simpson hurricane wind scale, categorized as strong with speeds of 111 to 130 miles per hour. We're expecting three to six meters of storm surge within 40 kilometers of the hurricane path and one to three within 200 kilometers. Clusters of thunderstorms should begin to take over in this large disturbance. Where that occurs is uncertain and could cause a significant shift to the position and hence the forecast of this system. In addition to the uncertain track forecast, this system has multiple obstacles to combat with the next few days. Extensive damage is expected in affected areas, including foliage torn from trees and shrubbery, fallen trees, poorly constructed signs will most likely be blown down, damage to roofs will occur along with some potential window and door damage, Structural damage may be sustained by small buildings, residences, and utility buildings. Lastly, mobile homes are among those at the high, structures at the highest risk. Now, when we talk about the category of a hurricane, that does not explain all the potential risks. There are two principal risks with a hurricane, high winds and storm surge. And these two are very much tied to the category, which describes how strong the winds are at the center circulation. 
That's why we're asking people that are outside the evacuation zones during the storm to stay inside, away from exterior walls and windows. Stay in interior areas like you would for tornadoes, but for a much longer period of time until the storm passes. Now to you, AJ. From the planning team, we have a map. As you can see, this is not just any map. It's a digital elevation map, or DEM, which shows us the elevations of an area using different colors. The yellow and green colors indicate a higher elevation, while the dark blue and purple indicate a lower elevation. Elevation maps are helpful because it allows us to predict which areas might get the most flooding and therefore which places need to be evacuated immediately. Now from the logistics team, we have a couple of visuals to help us better make sense of our situation. On the left-hand side, we see a projection of the storm's path. It moves to the northwest from the Atlantic Ocean, eventually hitting the New England region. And to our right, we have another graph. This one is a combined graph that helps us visualize the storm paths again, as well as its wind speeds and SVI, or Social Vulnerability Index, plus the population data. We can gather from this visual that all areas are being hit pretty equally. In preparation for Hurricane Tim, the state of Massachusetts has implemented regional and statewide measures. The regions of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island have emergency operations centers activated and staffed by various members from the Department of Transportation and Public Services, Office of General Services, Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, Department of Health and the Massachusetts Division of Military and Naval Affairs. The Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services has been in contact with emergency managers for filling stockpiles and patrolling coastal areas typically susceptible to high tides. In addition, they will be responding with generators for potential power outages and implementing emergency personnel for evacuation. Now let's hand things over to the planning team for a bit as they will be walking us through more information regarding projections, evacuations, and shelters. With Hurricane Tim quickly approaching, we have our best teams leading the response. First up, the planning team is mapping the projected flooding of this storm. The members of the team have graciously come to speak with us about the work they're doing. But first, a quick video will be presented. planning team. Hello. Welcome to the planning team. The members being Evelyn, Shreya, Michael, Shruti, Jasmine, Anushka, and myself, Alex. So for a bit of context, the planning team has three main tasks. First, to build a projection of the storm surge using a DEM. Second, with the DEM, digital elevation model, generate three evacuation zones being A, B, and C. And finally, to determine what facilities and shelters are needed for people affected by Hurricane Tim. On to you, Michael. Uh, yes, the concept of this hurricane grid shows the possible locations of where the hurricane might make landfall. As you can see, the grid is broken up into 16,000 one kilometer squares, which would be the basis for all of our data sets. This grid is marked in MGRS because it is a precise military grid reference system. Lastly, this grid also has important information such as the population, health, transfer score of these individual squares. If you look on your right hand side on 19T, the most likely place for the hurricane hit to hit is BH, BG, CG, DG, and CH. Up next is my teammate Anushka. Hi everyone. So our first task was to build a projection of the potential affected areas using digital elevation models. So as we can see on the left, this is a digital elevation model, which varies based on the different elevations, green being more of a higher elevation and blue being a lower elevation. And using this, we can kind of uh, build a flood map to see 
like which areas would be most affected given a certain storm, storm surge. So in order to calculate this, we essentially took the elevation levels and we took the storm, the storm levels and we subtracted them from one another to generate the map on the right. So as we can see, the areas in the red are the ones that would be generally affected by a flood given a certain storm surge. Yeah, and so this is just some code for that. On the left, we're opening our image of the elevation model and we're essentially plotting it onto a map. And on the right, we're doing basically the same thing, except now we're subtracting storms, we're subtracting elevation from storm surge in order to generate this kind of depth map. Now I'm gonna hand it over to my teammate, Jasmine. After learning that the storm surge levels would be between three and six meters, we created an improved flooding map. To do this, we used a bathtub filling model. A bathtub filling model is able to take any elevation underneath a specific storm surge and mark it as flooded, which we can see on in the graph that all the red areas are being marked as flooded. Um, now turning it over to my colleague, Michael. Uh, uh, yes, hi. So we generated this model using a function called zonal stats. This give us, gives us the mean and max of the flooding in each cell. This way we can plot a polygon in order to show where the flooding is. Up next is my colleague, Shruti. Alongside flooding, we also have to consider other factors of the populations and areas that are affected. Uh, for example, the social vulnerability index indicates the uh, composition of a certain area and how vulnerable they would be to hazardous situations like this hurricane. So by factoring in the social vulnerability index alongside population and flooding, we can determine which areas are most uh, at risk due to flooding and prioritize those areas which are less resilient. Now on to Evelyn for further information on evacuation zones. So to create the evacuation zones and using the flooding maps, we used factors such as the expected depth of the storm surge along with the social vulnerability data like we talked about and along with the population in these zones. Using these factors, we created ratios that we could then filter out to get the areas of highest risk, the highest risk zone being zone A and then zone B and zone C with least risk. We will evacuate these areas in order from highest risk to least risk so that the areas facing more damage will be prioritized. So these are the evacuation zones we came up with, zone A being in blue, zone B in orange, and zone C in green. These zones are based on which areas have the most flooding, the most vulnerability, and the highest population, so that we can get the people out who will be the most affected. And now I'll hand it off to my teammate, Sharia. Thank you, Evelyn. Now that we have all of our evacuation zones, the next question that we had to ask is which shelters do we send these people to and how many? The assumption that we made for this scenario was that 80% of people in the evacuation zones actually evacuated and 50% of this evacuated population needed a shelter. We calculated the population that evacuated, which was around 670,000 people. Those that needed shelters included 40% of the evacuated people, which was around 270,000 people. And based off data that each shelter could hold 500 people, our resulting calculation was that we needed at least 538 shelters. Now let's take a look at the image on the left. The blue dots represent all the shelters in the area. The red part represents the flooding due to the hurricane. As you can see, a lot of shelters are in the same area as the flooded region, so we had to find a way to choose, choose shelters that are safe for people to go to. Now that we knew how many shelters we needed, we had to pick a pick safe shelter locations. We decided to factor out shelters that may be in a flooded region. Our criteria was that if there was a flood within 100 meters within a shelter, we, we decided not to use it. Here's a snippet of our code that we use to access shelters that follow this criteria. The first cell shows how we access the flooded regions. The mean column of our data frame represents the average water level in the area. We then wrote a function to check if a shelter was within 100 meters of any of the flooded regions, and if it was, we did not use it for the evacuated people. After accessing the shelters, we were able, able to locate 540 safe shelters for evacuated people, as you can see plotted on the left in blue alongside the flooded areas in red. On the right, we also plotted unavailable shelters in purple, and as you can see, all of these lie in the flooded regions. 
Now I will be handing it off to my teammate, Alex. Thank you so much for listening to the planning phase of the Hurricane Tim's disaster response. Through this process, we've learned the challenges of decision-making in a short time span that could affect many lives. Through careful analysis and selection of data, we've realized that responding to a disaster revolves around making the least worst decision with the limited options available. We've been working closely with the logistics, public information, and operation team to prepare and mitigate the impacts of Hurricane Tim. Back to the public information team. As you can see, the planning team has worked diligently to predict Hurricane Tim's paths, as well as organizing the evacuation process. We will now be moving on to our first interview portion of this press conference. So first off, what would you say was the biggest challenge that your group as a whole faced? Uh, yes, I can speak on that. So we faced a few challenges with constructing images of all the data we got in a designated area and programming a tool to use that data. This was due to the fa fact that all of these images were different formats. So we have to convert them all into one format. Then we can start anal analyzing the data. Thank you. How did your team make decisions regarding the evacuation zones? And what factors came into play there? For the evacuation zones, we primarily um, looked at the area's elevation uh, and the social vulnerability index. And mainly we were focusing on areas with a lower average elevation and higher social vulnerability. And to choose the shelters, we factored in the flooding from the hurricane. Thank you. As a follow-up to that last question, what do you think were the potential impacts of those decisions? Depending on the zone designation process, so as Shreya mentioned, some areas would suffer because they'd become less of a priority if they didn't meet the criteria we had. Additionally, the tool for computing storm surge that we designed would allow authorities during the forecasted hurricane to prioritize the areas that will most likely need emergency response services during a recovery. Thank you so much. We will now pass it on to Charlie, our weatherman, who now has new information about Hurricane Tim. So here's our update about Hurricane Tim. As we get closer to the hurricane, our most recent model here in dark blue tells us which particular areas are most threatened by the storm. The worst hit areas appear to be Boston, Warshire, Dedham, Brockton, Province, Newport, and New Bedford. Heavy rain and gusty winds will be expected in these areas, triggering flash flooding and mudslides. Now to you, Christine. Thank you, Charlie and the planning team. Your work is invaluable to this effort. Next up is the operations team who will be documenting this event. They'll be using a Lottie data set, also known as the Low Altitude Disaster Imagery data set, to present a set of tools that can detect multiple types of damage in infrastructure during this disaster. In, ad in addition, they'll provide a Civil Air Patrol cap imagery to identify the real time situation in southern parts of Massachusetts in northern parts of Rhode Island in terms of road and building conditions. We will now show a quick video as an introduction to the operations team. it over to you, operations. Uh, hi. So um, our tasks as the operations team were to create a classifier, that an Im an image classifier using deep learning to recognize types of damage, as well as an image localization tool that would provide more detailed information about the affected areas. Both of these tools are currently being implemented by disaster responders and will help them make more informed decisions faster. Uh, because I was part of the deep learning team, I'll go a bit more into depth about that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, 
the deep learning team used a data set known as LADI, or the Low Altitude Disaster Image Data Set which contains many pictures of disasters, each associated with a list of features in that image, which include, but are not limited to, fire damage, flooding, buildings, and bridges. Um, the deep learning team was tasked with using an architecture called a convolutional neural net to predict the features given inside an image. Uh, now I'll hand it off to uh, my, my teammate, Emery, who will talk more about the convolutional neural net architecture and about the model we used. All right, thank you, Yash. So convolutional neural networks fall under the category of deep learning. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a computational technique with which we can solve complicated problems which traditional algorithms are simply unsuited for. These work through a series of layers starting with the input, whereupon data is passed through the network and acted upon by each of the hidden layers, which contain neurons that apply function onto the data with a certain weight, an important value affecting the output of the function. As the network trains, it can essentially realize which weights lead to which output, and through a process called backpropagation, change these weights to produce the desired output for any given input. With this approach, these deep learning algorithms can basically learn how to solve especially complicated problems. For our specific purposes, we use a convolutional neural network, or CNN, with a total of seven layers, the most important of which are the four convolutional layers, to apply multiple la labels onto the images from the Lottie dataset with the type of damage and the infrastructure present. Especially with convolution layers, we represent the weights before mentioned before as matrices, what we call filters. These work by multiplying across the image, as you see in the top right of the screen. And for each corresponding weight on the filter and the image matrix, there's an element-wise multiplication. Basically, with different filters, we can recognize different, different features in the image. And through further algorithms like pooling and the rectified linear activation function, or just ReLU, we can pick up very complicated and abstract details from an image. What this means for our purposes of labeling images is that we can change our filters to recognize the proper features of the images that are associated with the labels. So you can imagine the network will now be able to recognize through large amounts of water or buildings through their sharp edges, et cetera, all which are picked up through convolutional layers through the filters it learns to form after training on the Lottie data set and with, through which it can correctly label all of the data we give it. I think we'll be having Yash again. Because the solution to our problem is learned and not algorithmic, it's important to have robust and informative performance characterization. So as you can see on the right, there's a confusion matrix which describes the distribution of answers specifically for the flood water category. So you can see that the upper left and bottom right squares are where the model, the model classified the image of flood and water correctly. So they're colored a bit darker. So going a bit more into the graph, you can see, for example, that of all images that have floods in them, 76.6 .6 of them were classified correctly and 22.8 were classified incorrectly. And overall, the model could predict if there was flood and water in an image 76% of time with a 23.1 for a chance of misclassification. And these confusion, uh, and this prediction happens for all 15 possible labels in an image. Moving on, the ROC or receiving receiver operating characteristics curve. So on the legend on the right, you can see all of the possible labels of an image, like flood water, smoke fire, buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So this graph shows the relationship between the true positive rate and the false positive rate for each of these possible labels. Um, I'm not going to get into the, um, the technical side of how exactly this is calculated, but in essence, the black dotted line represents the performance of simply guessing, and the dotted pink line represents the micro average ROC curve, or in other words, the average performance. Curves generally closer to the top left corner are generally better. As you can see, most of the curves are relatively close to the top corner, except for one, so there is definitely some room for improvement. Uh, now I'll be handing it off to another uh, teammate, Neil, who will talk more about implementing an algorithm um, in a challenge called XU2. In addition, uh, we studied this model called XU2. So what is XView? So XView is a high resolution disaster imagery data set, which is developed by the Defense Innovation Unit, which is an organization by the United States Department of Defense. And um, in comparison to Lottie, uh, the XV2 dataset is captured by high-resolution cameras from satellites. 
And this gives us a very much greater level of detail that we can use to actually classify more than just whether an image contains a certain type of disaster. The XV2 challenge, which is also sponsored by the Defense Innovation Unit, attempts to address solutions by classifying buildage, building damage and structures. So instead of just classifying what type of damage an image contains, it is also trying to classify the extent of damage and uh, where the buildings and roads and uh, infrastructure actually is within the image. So it is much more advanced. And uh, we attempted to implement the fifth place solution into our project. We studied uh, how it performed. And as you can see on the right, um, we have uh, this example of the building classifications. And as you can see, the red represents the most damage, white represents the least damage, and yellow represents the mid-level damage. And the image next to it shows us training the, actually the model Below it is the architecture of the model. So what this basically does is it takes the pre-disaster image, so before the disaster actually happened, and compares the image that was taken after the disaster happened. And using that, it attempts to basically locate each building and classify how different it was so that it can figure out how much damage was actually done. So this is an example of what I was talking about previously. Um, so the image on the left is the previous before the disaster image in the middle is the actual classification and image after is actually what happened after the disaster. As you can see, uh, it did classify the buildings pretty well. Uh, next slide. And now I will pass it off to the cap, uh, image localization team. Thanks, Neil. Hi, I'm Gabe. And our group was in charge of using the CAP images and were tasked with creating a useful tool that would help disaster responders better understand the data they'll be working with. So I'll explain how we plotted the locations of the CAP images on a map. Mira will talk about supplementing this map with a digital elevation overlay. And finally, Dimitri will discuss how we just, uh, created three-dimensional models with image reconstruction. So what is CAP? Well, CAP stands for the Civil Air Patrol, and they do many different things, including emergency response. They're involved in roughly 85% of all search and rescue missions in the US and also deliver supplies, provide transportation and assess damage in affected communities. So part of their job is taking aerial photos of affected areas. This imagery is very high resolution and very important in a post-disaster situation. So as mentioned before, one of the things we did was visualize where the cap images are taken and the points of interest that are in it, such as hospitals and airports. So all of the CAP images are from the Lottie data set. We have the coordinates of the hurricane path. And so by using the latitude and longitude of each image, we plotted where they were taken on this map. This is useful because it gives context to the CAP images and allows users to visualize where each image is located. So now that we know where all the CAP images are, we can use OpenStreetMap, which is an open source software with map data to find points of interest in the CAP images. We did this by creating a buffer around the coordinates of the image and filtering and plotting data such as amenities, which includes schools, airports, and others into the map. And so this shows uh, that from one part of the map. We also decided to plot hospitals, shelters, airports, and clinics around the Boston area. It just shows that not only can you find different points of interest in the cap images, but also just in general using OpenStreetMap. Next, I'll pass it to Mira and she'll talk about the digital elevation model. Thanks, Gabe. So after getting the important buildings from OpenStreetMaps, we decided to provide elevation information to the people using our tools. That way, it'll be easier to visualize and recognize the locations in person, which will provide more spatial and thus situational awareness to the responders. Starting with the affected area on the left, I first found the GeoTIFF files that cover that space. Here you can see all eight of them. GeoTIFF files are used to store geospatial information, so they're very helpful in elevation modeling. From there, I was able to convert the files into the format that you see them in right now, which allows us to see the areas in a more three-dimensional way, as though the sun were shining from the northwest corner of the images. After that, I combined all of the individual geotiffs into a full rendering and covered up the coastal spaces that were either below or at sea level, so the ocean. From there, I cropped the full model so that it fits the affected area, and here we have the final result, a digital elevation model of the entire affected area that we can now overlay images on for an extremely useful disaster response tool. So that's what we did. Here you can see the digital elevation model of the affected area with thousands of red dots all over it corresponding to the locations of the cap imagery. 
With this, responders can learn more about the terrain in and around the photographed areas and can gain a lot of situational awareness for when they're on scene. With the help of our tool, they'll be able to better respond to the crisis and help more people. Now, using this map, we wanted to go a bit further. As you can see, there's a plethora of groupings throughout the affected area. Thanks to this, we can create 3D reconstructions of each area from a ground view rather than a bird's eye view. I'll now hand it off to Dimitri to explain this further. Thank you, Mira. For the last few days, we have been working with CAP images to see what useful tools we could create with them. While looking at the CAP images, we noticed how some of the images were very close to each other. We decided to further focus on the images that were captured in the magnified area shown here. There are around 600 blue dots in this area representing the pictures taken from this location. We saw that we could use the images to create a three-dimensional model. Creating a three-dimensional model requires at least two images that were taken in near proximity from each other. For our data set, one matching set are the two images seen on the slide. As you can see, the buildings marked by the red circle is still visible in both images, making the reconstruction more likely to succeed due to the building's distinct edges. After attempting to reconstruct all the possible images, we finally modeled it on a 3D plane, and this is what we got. This slide shows another pair of reconstructed images. After we gathered the partial reconstructions, we created a program that could predict the boundaries of each of the images. We used the boundaries to create a polygon shape for each of the images, signifying the area of land that could be seen from the respective image. We then added the points of the locations of each of the camera shot to further improve the plot. All this modeling can be incredibly useful since it can map out an object from as little as two images. If given more closely taken images, the models can be even more accurate and create a detailed rendering of a location. We'll now hand the mic back to Alex from the public input team. Thank you, operations team. At this time, we'll have Alex will be conducting a live interview with the operations team. Thanks, Christine. It's clear how hard the operations team has worked to complete all aspects of their mission. How does your team determine how to divide up the work? Uh, I'll speak on the behalf of the deep learning team and the whole operations team as a whole. And uh, basically, based on our strengths and weaknesses, we wanted to work on the, our uh, best, the task that we, could, we thought that we could do best on. And we divided up based on that. And we worked together every morning and communicated what, where we were and assisted each other when there was help needed. Sounds like a good strategy. What challenges did your group members experience either collaboratively or individually, and how did you overcome those setbacks? I can speak on behalf of the image localization team for this question. So our main challenge was time. A lot of the things we originally wanted to do would have taken us or even people with a lot more experience months to complete. So we spent a good chunk of time trying to figure out what we could reasonably do in a couple of days. We overcame this by taking the time to communicate with one another and understanding what would be most helpful to disaster responders. Thank you so much, operations team. Now back to Charlie for a live weather update on Hurricane Tim. Thank you, Alex. As you can see, I am here at Cape Cod as this storm is quickly approaching. The winds here are reaching 40 miles per hour. Our team was barely able to get here through the downed power lines. We have to leave before the winds pick up any further and we become trapped. We strongly recommend that you do not go outside. Emergency services will be discontinued in the next hour for those who did not evacuate. We'll keep you updated, but please stay indoors and stay safe. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Charlie. Next up is the logistics team who will, will be providing routing and resource management information. They'll be using a name grid to map a network of helicopter, tractor, trailer trucks, and pickup truck routes to certain facilities in the area in order to deliver relief with supplies. Before we hand things over to the logistics team, here's a short clip to introduce them.
Okay, we are the logistics team. Um, our first task was asset deployment. So first we were given a game grid and we had to pick two bases to direct our relief efforts from based on the social vulnerability index and Hurricane Tim's projected track. So we used the, uh, we put that into a column called risk and then plotted it here. So you, as you can see, the lighter areas are at a greater risk uh, of Hurricane Tim. We also wanted to incorporate um, the ease of transportation from the bases to every other node within a certain angle from that base. So ease of transportation was a score based off of the transport score of every cell on the grid. Again, we wanted to prioritize social vulnerability index, so we weighted it uh, with a greater weight. So our nodes are the facilities that we need to give supplies to. So we needed to get supplies to shelters, hospitals, EMS, um, cell towers, and power plants. So here uh, you can see the transport score before and after the hurricane. As you can see, uh, Cape Cod, as well as a large portion of the Boston area, was negatively affected by Hurricane Tim. So these are our available vehicles. We decided to use the 20, or 20 tractor trailers that we were given because it was the most optimal way by cost and it has the most capacity relative to the helicopter and pickup truck, although we do sacrifice speed. So as you can see by this graphic, these are our two bases. And uh, as you can see, base one is closer to the Boston area due to its lower relative social vulnerability index. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Anshul and Ethan. Okay, so how do we actually um, make it easier for us to deliver supplies for facilities? Um, we have shelters, hospitals, all these kinds of uh, things that we need to deliver to. So how do we, how do we actually do that? Well, one thing we can do is perhaps if we break the whole region into smaller subregions, then we can make it easier to access all these subregions. So we do that through the military grade ref reference system. Okay, here you can see the Cape Cod area and it's broken down into these tiny, tiny squares. These are one kilometer by one kilometer square grids. Uh, and then from if we just navigate these grids instead of the whole larger area, we should be able to make it easier for us to navigate everything. Okay, so here's how all the little squares are organized. It's, it's a lot to take in, but I, I wanna direct your attention to three things. We have the MDRS uh, ID on the left side. So every single of these little squares has a unique ID. Now we can use this ID to identify and work with these cells um, when we need to direct our supplies. Now, further a bit further to the right, we have the easting score and we have the northing score. So every single uh, cell or tiny square has an easting score. So how east it is and how north it is. Think of it as basically coordinates. Um, we can use this to locate every single cell so we know where they're located. And these three things combined, we can uh, guide and navigate through them. But how do we actually turn it into a network that we can use to support, that we can use to do algorithmic calculations? Um, I'll let Ethan take over that. Thank you. Uh, so before we continue on to the vehicle routing task, we first have to convert the game grid that was provided into a network graph. This makes it uh, easier for a job uh, considering uh, asset deployment. So first we created an empty network graph and then we iterated through every single cell in the provided game grid. And for each of those cells, we would iterate through all the potential neighbor positions, which included the east, west, north, and south uh, directions. For example, an eastern neighbor would be a position that's uh, one position to the right of that particular cell. And then we would check whether these uh, neighbor positions actually existed. And if they did exist, then we would add an edge between that cell and that neighbor, which you can see in the displayed code. We use the military grid reference system ID, so it's easier for us to reference the nodes at a later time. When calculating the weight of these edges, we use a, a specific formula which takes into account the transport score or how easy it is a uh, travel across a certain area. More specifically, we took the inverse transport score of the node that we're uh, traveling from and combine it with the inverse transport score of the node that we're traveling to. This makes it easier for us, easier for us to calculate how long it takes to travel across each cell later. 
When it comes to graphing, we created a list of the bases that we selected, uh, as Jessica showed you earlier. And to draw the edges of the network graph, we've uh, we made the node size the node size smaller, so it's easier for us to see the edges, which are rather thin. And when drawing the base nodes, we used we specified the node list as the list of bases that we defined earlier. And here you can see a clear representation of the edges on the network graph. I'll hand it off to Declan. Thanks, Ethan. So the problem we have now is what's called a vehicle routing problem, which is where you have a base, usually called a depot, a fleet of vehicles, and a bunch of different locations that you need to supply, which in our case are shelters, hospitals, cell towers, and emergency services. And we need to figure out optimal routes for the different vehicles to take to reach all of these locations within a short time frame of 48 hours. What you see here is an example of a basic vehicle routing problem. However, the one we have to tackle has a couple more attributes. We have two bases instead of one, which makes it multi-depot. And also the vehicles we're using have a specific capacity, which can only supply a certain amount of locations per route. These attributes actually change the name to a capacitated multi-depot vehicle routing problem. We also have a few more constraints on this. We need to keep the cost down to be within budget and a single path through a vehicle can't take longer than 12 hours. This is what's called an NP hard problem, which means that an exact solution can't be solved in polynomial time. So one of the things we need to do is make a trade-off between getting the most optimized exact solution, which would take a very long time with the high number of locations we have to visit, versus getting a good satisfactory solution in a much faster time period. Since in disaster response, you need to react quickly, we decided to go for a good satisfactory solution. And now I'll pass it on to Rishi to show you our methodology. Uh, so in terms of our methodology for solving this problem, we wanted to first solve a slightly smaller problem called the traveling salesman problem and apply it to different subregions that we created of the main region. So what is the traveling salesman? It's an optimization to find the shortest path that visits every node or place in a graph, as you can see on the image on the right. For example, finding the shortest route between a group of restaurants in New York City. This is obviously very applicable to our issue with disaster relief, as we need to find the shortest route to deliver supplies to different facilities that would need our aid. In terms of actually creating these subregions, we first wanted to split the Cape region in the east and deal with it separately because it's disjointed from the rest of the area and it was hard to get support there. So we used the areas that intersected with these polygons that we manually created using code in order to split these regions. And then for the rest, we made sectors using angles based on how much time we would have to spend in that area. And we ended up getting a lot of different um, sectors. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, within each region, we had to tr solve the traveling salesman problem to efficiently route between all the different locations. So to solve the traveling salesman problem, we first used the gradient method to make an initial estimate of the shortest path. It's shown in the diagram on the screen. So in this method, you start at one of the bases and you keep going to the closest location you haven't visited yet. While this method doesn't find the best path, usually it's a good initial estimate. After that, we use 2opt to optimize the path. 2 op is a method that whenever the path crosses itself, it tries to swap nodes so the path no longer crosses itself. Because usually, if a path crosses itself, it's longer than if it did not. This is repeated until no swaps can be made to make the route shorter. Once this was done, we were left with a path for every region. The paths, can you go to the next slide? The paths of the regions before the event are shown here. On the left are the paths only showing the nodes visited and on the right are the actual paths based upon the grid cells. Based upon this, we also made a route for after the hurricane. So, but the problem was one of the routes was too long, greater than the 12 hour ma min maximum time. So we split that route in two based upon latitude and solved the problem like that. I'll pass it back to Jessica for a summation. Uh, thank you, Johan. And that was our logistics presentation. I'm going to pass it back to AJ. 
Thank you, logistics team. As you can see, there were many tasks that the logistics team was in charge of, from asset deployment to coming up with a method for the vehicle routing problem. Before we move on, we have a few questions for you. The first question is, what impact did the limited resources have in solving this problem? Um, I think I can answer this one. So because of the limited resources, we obviously had to create priorities. So we prioritized people and communities that were closer to our bases and that were more vulnerable, such as um, the Boston area. That makes sense. If you were given more time and or resources, would you have taken a different approach? I guess I can take a stab at this. So um, for right now, uh, what we did was we had two main algorithms um, to solve the vehicle routing problem. We use greedy and two up. The problem is that these are not uh, optimized. So they're good at algorithms and they work for our purposes, but they're not, um, they're not the best that there can be. So if we had more time and uh, more resources, we could have definitely tried to implement better algorithms, which, uh, which would be harder for us to implement, but in the end, it would give us a better result in terms of uh, time and um, the resources delivered. I see. Um, lastly, what do you perceive as potential impacts of the decisions you've made throughout this project? So although we do hit um, every single facility that we need to, um, we are prioritizing uh, areas with low or high social vulnerability indexes and areas in close proximity to our bases. As such, some people living on Cape Cod in the peninsula or to the Northwest may not get resources um, as quickly. Thank you all for your answers. Um, passing it on to Christine, who will get us started for a final Q&A. We will now begin the general questions and answer session. Anyone can ask any question about the teams about any part of their project. And I'll hand it off to you. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a question, answer, a question asking box underneath the stream. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the box. Um, we'll have our teaching assistants read through um, as they come in. Yeah, so we have some good questions here already. I can start out with the first one. Um, so a question for anyone on the team, has this course encouraged you to work in your local community to improve the response to a crisis? Um, I can answer it, okay. Um, well, for me, I know that many upperclassmen in my school, they talk about, oh, doing internships at like Google or Facebook or things like that. But, you know, after learning about this course, it taught me that it made me realize that I could still use my computer science knowledge, but to actually um, help the community more than just, you know, work at a company. Um, so I think that was really important for me. Um, I would say a similar thing. Uh, this course has taught me a lot on what's really out there. And instead of just aiming for working for some popular job, I like, uh, let's say, I don't wanna really call out anyone, just like uh, Google ads, I guess. Uh, it's really important to uh, realize like what you like, you wanna realize what you love to do and then make an impact in the world by doing something that has an actual direct impact such as uh, disaster response. Yeah, those were great answers, guys. Does anyone else have anything before we move on to the next question? I can give a quick answer. So I had never really thought about disaster response before this course. And so seeing how much data there is and how much we can do with that data has been really eye-opening for me. And it's definitely piqued my interest. I'm definitely going to try to keep improving our image localization tool after this program is over. So. Yeah, this program has also really opened my eyes to all the different aspects of disaster response there are through the speakers that we've had. I mean, we had one speaker talking about working with dogs and disaster response and another who worked more on like the global health aspect of disaster response. So there's a lot of different areas um, that really interest me within this broad term of disaster response. Um, I never considered just how large the, I guess, web is for uh, collaboration. We've got these people teaching uh, a neural network how to uh, determine deep learning stuff and how in the end that connects to your local weather, man. I just love the collaboration that goes into this. Okay, so yeah, um, 
those were some great answers. So um, I guess we can move on to the next question now, which is, do you have a better appreciation of what goes into crisis response after this class? Um, uh, I think oh, or, do you want to go? Or? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, after uh, one session with the entire FEMA Task Force One team, I really realized how much work they put in into each disaster and how many years it takes to recover. It, and it's really amazing how they work so hard, but their budget is not even like one, like thousands of, of the other big companies' budgets. Um, uh, in my opinion, I didn't realize like how much went into disaster relief similar to Michael. Um, but like all these guest speakers kind of like show you just how like how many different aspects there are. So you kind of like look at it from like a lot of different viewpoints and also like even like the politics that go on behind it and just like yeah, there's so many different things. I would also add that um, I realized that a lot of disaster response is uh, planning. So like before the disaster, there's a lot of like data collection, um, imaging and like all the kind of modeling that you saw today uh, going on, that's also part of the response and it's not just uh, picking up afterwards. Um, I just wanted to add that, like, I just think it's just so inspiring to see what like people do to help with disaster response in such a short time frame. Like one of our guest speakers were a, uh, was a firefighter and he talked about how he had to like rotate schedules and they had to work all day and then they took turns taking shifts. And that was just like so eye opening to see um, what goes on into like actually combating a disaster and how much planning it takes. To build on what Trey just said, our speakers were really amazing. We spoke with uh, a lot of people like at FEMA, like working at the top, like organizing disasters, but we also spoke at people like working with like quadcopters and drones and taking images for that for disasters. And we just had really qualified, amazing speakers that are really open. You know, that was amazing. In addition, um, I would like to add that, uh, especially for me, the deep learning and the machine learning part really opened my eyes on what was possible with, uh, with these tools. And um, now I am really considering looking into a, probably a, also a computer science degree, even though originally I was going for uh, aerospace engineering. Uh, adding on. Uh, taking this course made me realize that there's a large community when it comes to uh, remote sensing for disaster response. And you can feel that there's an inherent desire to learn and contribute to the well-being of people everywhere when it comes. I think on to Ethan, uh, the, most of the world is usually competitive where uh, one person tries to beat the other person. Uh, in, this, in this field, it's, uh, it's, it's really more like people working together, trying to have the same goal to beat everything to beat this disaster and try to improve the world. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah, like those were some great answers. So should we move on to the next question now? A question from the audience is, what are the key, takeaway, key takeaways uh, from this course uh, for the students? So what do you guys take away from this course? Um, I have something really quick. So I think a big thing that I'm taking away from this course is that it's just not one facet that makes everything work. Everyone on the team specializes in something different. Like, I think especially something that I saw while we were all putting this presentation together is that it wouldn't be the same without a single one of us. Like we all brought something different to the table, but it, it just made it so much better because, um, yeah, so no matter like what you're doing, I guess, in disaster response, whether it's looking at the politics or coding or um, actually physically being there to help out with disaster response, like everyone has a really important goal and working together with people who, who might not be anything like you or have the same expertise or skill level is, is just really important. And I'm glad I got this experience. Um, adding on to that vein, I would like to say that this course has really like taught me about the importance of collaboration. Like just because disaster response is all about a bunch of bunch of different organizations and people coming together and providing their skills to help others and build people up. So collaboration in response in just the coding and presenting and just being able to connect with people and learn about what they can bring to the table is such an important part of this. Uh, also, I would like to say that you know, when people think of um, disaster response, it's usually like um, you know, bringing people food and water 
uh, going in and getting out. That's 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 the usual uh, perception of disaster response. But there's 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 so much stuff that goes um, that comes before that. It's it's ninety percent other stuff and then ten percent um, doing the actual response. So I think that's that's um, that's that's very inspirational to think about. Uh, yeah, adding on um, this course really taught me uh, about disaster response, but it also taught me. Um, how computer science is a very broad study and, you know, it can be applied to many different things, um, even when you think it can't apply. So, um, you know, I used to think, I used to see myself maybe like, you know, working at like some kind of software company um, and just, um, you know, doing my job. But I, I think this course really opened my eyes and um, I think I might want to pursue research or make a bigger impact on this world. I would also add that uh, before I used to think like, since there have been so many like disasters, even just in the US, um, over the course of, I guess, history, um, that disaster response is kind of well thought out, uh, uniform, things like that. But from the speakers, and from what we learned in class, uh, we realized that there's still a long way to go um, in terms of like, uh, creating like some sort of guideline uh, because every, not only is every area different, but also every disaster is different. So I definitely learned that uh, disaster response is very individualized to the disaster and that it's really about the effect that it has on the people affected. I would also like to add upon that. Um, I think in the past with volunteering with like um, disaster organizations such as Red Cross, um, there, the work was done um, in a more um, manner that wasn't productive. And I think in this course, it brought new um, aspects of how um, there is a lot of work that could be done in the future um, using um, all this technology coding. And um, I feel like there is a lot of improvement and um, work to be done. Uh, I would also like to add, so from this program, I've realized, you know how they say like 60% of the jobs that we'll have in 10 years don't exist today. And with the changing world, disaster response is going to open up so much to new ideas that we haven't even thought of yet. And I think it's, uh, this course has shown how relevant that is. Thank you guys for your, all of your answers to this last question. Uh, the next question we have is, um, related to the open source projects that you've been using throughout this course. So throughout this course, we've taught you how to use OpenSFM. We've taught you about the Lottie data set and a few other open source projects. How has your use work with open source technology and other community software development changed your views from before and after this course? And what are your thoughts on open source development now? I think I can answer this one. So before this course, um, at least personally, I traditionally thought of uh, open source projects as kind of like group collaboration. It's just kind of a very uh, informal public uh, occurrence. However, after I see these open source projects, especially like XView2, where these are very highly advanced, um, especially applicable disaster response technologies, I'm really thinking open source is much better than private source and that rather than just simply opening up to anyone, you have very advanced researchers and particularly Ryan just keeping that technology confined to one individual and such. Actually, in our group, we were able to use a lot of open source technologies and build off of them to build, make our deep learning classifier. And they really helped improve our accuracy. And I imagine if I continue, or any of us continue on in coding for this use, open source products will form like a large basis of that uh, kind of building upon where you can take the work of others and build upon them, Ryan is starting from scratch that really helps in just overall improving the disaster response and the accuracy, how well you were able to respond. And in the end, it's kind of, it's no, there's no winners in disaster response. It's simply seeing how well all of us together can solve a disaster. Also, like, especially in disaster response, like, if you make like a really cool tool like XV2 where it recognizes the damage to buildings, and if if it's open source, there's many different countries and like hundreds of organizations 
who have different problems. And if it's open source, all of them can use it. Like, for example, the um, XV2 uh, challenge solutions were used in the Australian brush fires, even though it's a, and like all kinds of different events are, can be used. And otherwise, it's just that one person or one organization who made it, who can use it for that purpose. Um, I would like to also add to what uh, Johan said. Uh, so for me, the XV2 uh, data set was especially useful and uh, and like one of the, uh, actually the submissions had several forks on GitHub and people were already developing those tools into being better and faster. And I feel like with open source, it's just, you will, you can have so much more exponential growth compared to closed source because with closed source, it's just, um, you know, just several people working on it, but having open source, uh, to having an open source tool allows it to grow exponentially faster. Uh, to piggyback off that point, open source, do, it allows you, as Emery said, to have the very best of the best improving the project but it also has that reach to allow input from those you normally wouldn't hear from. For instance, uh, some someone in a small college in the Midwest could introduce some great ideas to open source. And I think that's very important to get everyone's input. All right, so I think we have one more question from the audience before we turn it back over to the public information team. Uh, so this goes out to everyone as well. How has this course prepared you for the future? I think that it's definitely prepared me to work collaboratively with people because working like this over Zoom and not in person has definitely been challenged. It's also been really helpful to find new ways to collaborate. I think that's definitely gonna help me in the future. It's also shown me a lot of new things like all the open source technologies we use that we can definitely go back to and use in the future to create things. And it's also shown me that just like, you don't have to go like the typical path, like a lot of people already said, where you just go to work at some company, you can actually make something cool and do something to make a difference. Also, I would like to add on that, you know, this course has really given us such an opportunity and experience where we could um, listen to personal experiences by these professionals and really hear what they do in their lives. And it shows us, you know, the open, the field of opportunities and jobs that we could even pursue in the future. Uh, and to get this uh, eye-opening experience in high school, I think it's such a great opportunity that we can pursue it, you know, earlier. Um, and another thing that um, is great is pushing past your comfort zone. Like, particularly, I was nervous at the beginning of this because I'm not, I'm not the best or most experienced coder. But I still found and I learned so many things that I never would have even been exposed to if I hadn't... Um, took in part of this program. So that's great. So when we talk about the future uh, with college, for example, it can be very scary being 17 years old and you don't really know what you want to do with the rest of your life. And you have to make all these decisions for college. But for me personally, I think this uh, course has definitely steered me into a decent direction. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, that's all the time we have for audience questions right now. Um, thanks so much for everyone who submitted them and thank you all for uh, answering them. Uh, before we head out, we're going to head it back to the public information team to give some closing statements. All right. So this concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to AJ for any closing remarks. Thank you, Nitya. So this closes the remote sensing public information team reporting to you. As you know, the storm is going to be a focus for the next couple of days. It's important that people all along the coast monitor the progress of this storm. We thank you for getting the word out and we will be back in touch as the situation dictates. The press conference is now concluded. Thank you all for attending.